you know, I try to live my life authentically as a as an example, but people might not identify with me at all. And I feel like having these interviews with a variety of different people, if they see that I appreciate the authenticity in a variety of different people, maybe they'll say, oh, she is someone that I could work with, you know. Um, so that's kind of my inspiration for doing this project. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. It's Alyssa from Awaken Authenticity. And I'm super excited today because we have a special treat, which is literally a twofer. We got two people that I'm interviewing today instead of one. And they are two of my uncles. And so this is kind of special. These are the only family members that I'm interviewing for the series. So this is kind of fun. On your left, you'll see Clive Cole. And on your right, you see Graham Cole. They are both my dad's brothers from the Pole family. So they are sufficiently silly and um, uh, immature. introspective. What did you say? Immature. Immature. <laughs> and so here we go. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you two is that of all of the Pole family, I feel like the two of you are the most likely to be or at least express that you are happy in your life, or at least that you are aware of where you are in your life. I feel like there's a, a common thread of kind of dissonance otherwise in our family. And so I wanted to like encapsulate how you guys think about authenticity and, and particularly about familial expectations. So before we jump in, I want to kind of give our audience a little bit of a background. Graham and Clive and my dad's parents, my grandparents, are a concert pianists and concert violinists. And so they're super, super creative and uh, talented in their musical world. And they also are, they're marvelous people and they have a distinct idea unless you're a woman who has eight kids and is teaching piano and then doing concert piano recitals on the side you should be the breadwinner and the engineer in the family per se or or that sort of thing our family has five natural born boys and then three adopted children as well and there are two uh, doctors and a teacher and then these two are architects and then there is an artist and a chef and then one of our aunts is no longer with us and the fact that both Graham and Clive are architects strikes me as interesting because the whole family is super super creative and these are the two uncles that decided to take their interest in creativity and turn it into an acceptable profession. <laughs> so that's kind of where I want to start. How do you feel like our family expectations have influenced you in your own life and profession? Where to begin? <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a uh, really important question, I think, and it's certainly loaded for us because we had, you know, we had a very strong paternal influence um, who was very clear about his preferences and expectations and, uh, and also an artist, by the way. Uh, so I think, Gr I, I'll speak only for myself, Graham can speak for himself, but I think on some level we've all been, in some ways like you, Alyssa, navigating that line between art and commerce. And that for me, you know, I, I remain passionate about music, but I decided because I wanted a family that right at the time that I was graduating with a degree in music, I realized I was falling in love with my wife and knew I wanted children and the phone was ringing, so that's very authentic. Uh, and I knew I wanted to be there for my children and I knew I wanted a life at home and to help support a family so I moved toward architecture as a as a means to navigate between the world of art and commerce and so I, I think we had an awareness again speaking for myself only had an awareness about that dichotomy that is the creative life that inspires and motivates 
for reasons that are entirely impractical and uh, and this other need in this culture in which we live, which is about um, how, if you want children, how to support them. Um, and architecture sort of embodied that. I had always, I like Graham, had always been a graphic artist and had always drawn and always made things. And so I didn't just choose architecture randomly. I had, I had that muse as well. I was making furniture before I went to architecture school and carving things and drawing. And so it was kind of a way to embody that space between art and commerce. And, uh, and, it's, and it's really served pretty well in that regard for me quite honestly. But at the heart of your question is where did that come from? And it clearly came from familial communication and expectation. <laughs> is that, that, does that, does that resonate? Yeah, a little yeah bit? Sir, certainly. Um, and Graham, anything to add or, or say to that as well? well I mean, that, you know, to clarify, I think, um, and put things in a nutshell, for dad, the only thing that was really worthwhile to pursue was a medical degree. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean yeah. and that was hammered home over and over and over. And I, I uh, chose to study history as an undergraduate, which drove him up the wall. And, we and I, I would have to go home every two weeks and, and uh, talk him down off, <laughs> off the cliff, you know. And, I but I'm very story. good at that. I, I know how to talk, talk my dad down off the cliff. Unlike most of the bros who don't, who have problems with with uh, the emotional um, aspect of that pressure that he put that he uh, it brings to bear. Can you talk a little bit about that? What what is the mechanism that you enlist to to be able to do that? I don't know. I guess maybe um, temperament. Some of it's just in place, right? Yeah, I mean, I think you have more of it than I do, but he, Graham has a kind of a, uh, uh, a, just a steady temperament, I think. And I have some of it, too. I'm fairly able to deal with Dad, but I, I did blow up with him at one point in my 20s and just kind of and decided thereafter not to let him affect my emotional life. But I think Graham's been just better at managing it from I early think, on. I think I'm, I'm a person who, uh, <coughs> I like, I want to be liked, which is one of my pitfalls, too. But maybe that that um, comes from being the middle of five boys, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got it from I both never sides. Thought about that. That's probably maybe. Right. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Long periods of time during our childhood when I was, you know, when the two older boys and the two younger boys were kind of like the units, you know, and I was kind of floating in between, you know. But I think it's more. It's it maybe some of that, but it's also your nature. I mean, it's just who you who you were when you were born. I mean, it's the classic question of nature versus nurture, right? This is what we're, this is the line we're navigating right now. And, and nobody has answered this. Yeah. Ours is just a unique, ver perhaps a unique version of it, but it's the same old story, you know? Um, I mean, yeah. people come into my, I don't mean to, um, were you, did you finish? You are such a <laughs> fucking imperious. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You know, you know, you were saying people do. Well, people come into my house and I've built a lot of the furniture and, you know, and, and, and you go into dad's house and he's built a lot of the furniture and same with Gray. We all, we sort of, there are all these, all these relics of, of this line in our houses that, you know, that represent a lifetime of navigating that, those disparate uh, pulls. Yeah, uh, case in point, the piece of art behind you is a collaboration between you, Clive, and Nanny uh, and Willen. And oh, and yeah. And Graham, and, yeah. Graham did some painting on it. Yeah, I designed it, and Nanny did the ceramic work. So, yeah, totally. I mean, cool. that piece is a, uh, is, is a symptom of embodiment. our embodiment. Uh, yeah, it's a <laughs> symptom of our ailing uh, <laughs> dysfunction. <laughs> Uh, or or fun. It does, it does look like a virus a little bit. <laughs> yeah, never said that before. You're right. It does. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
oh yeah so now we're now we're starting to figure it's it not out. a virus it's the universe and it's about it's actually it's pertinent i mean we sat here kind of somewhat accidentally but it really is about you know what it is about i don't know if you're able to zero in on it but what it's about is about putting yourself out into the universe right so cool. that that little seed germ on the on i don't know what side it is on the screen but over there, that little circle is the, the birth of an idea, and it becomes let's, an, let's, let's go take a look at that embodiment. Thing. Cool. Right? That, this, that little piece right there is, is the birth of, a, of a, an idea or an individual, and it, 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 these, these uh, um, amoebic-like forms become something more human-like, and then that human form throws it back out to the universe. Very cool. Totally what this is about. And Graham painted this background here, which is about the, the uh, you know, this is the universe. This is infinity, right? And uh, anyway. So He's making excuses for bad art. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all, all bad art needs a, a storyline to, uh, to, move, to, to move toward the center. <laughs> Uh, oh, What's man. That interesting though that we sat in front of that piece it was really truly accidental yeah i love it i love it i didn't know the the storyline behind it before so getting back getting back to your your question um I, my my uh path to architecture was a little different from claude's i think i i remember as an undergraduate kind of what i really wanted to do was art was drawing painting and I remember thinking, well, maybe I could be an art therapist because that, that's a way to make money because I'm not going to be able to make money as a as an artist, which is a big misconception. I kind of regret that I had that misconception, but that was drilled into us too. And it is by our culture. You know, you can't be an artist, right? You can't you, no, can't, you no. can't support a family if you're an a artist. Family, right. And um, I know so, plenty of people uh, that do, by the way. Of course, I'm just saying that's a misconception. Right. That, right. You know, but, it is that's yeah. the storyline that's the storyline yeah and so um so anyway i i just i stayed away from art i mean i studied art history and other things but um uh, ultimately um so that that it's funny because i look back and i realize that that inclination to be an art therapist uh is something that is probably truer to my um to who I am as a person than anything, it probably would have been the ideal career for me. Um, but, uh, and I came into architecture kind of almost uh, accidentally in that I was, I worked in government. I, I, I uh, ended up in government and- uh, You know, we, we are our therapists, certainly as architects. Yeah, in some respects, I guess that's true. <laughs> So you went into state government. Anyway, so I, I just got exposed to technical um, water treatment plants, sewage treatment plants, and public facilities, and and I had a proclivity for the technical aspects of that that other people didn't have, and so I kind of got a lot of responsibility around that, and 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 I and I've always been painting and drawing all my life. I never stopped painting, and so there was I, I recognized that architecture could be a good place to blend those two um, capabilities mm -hmm. that's actually pretty similar to my story don't you think just mm -hmm. different disciplines but. yeah yeah yes but i guess the long and the long and the short of it is that architecture for us was a way of um meeting the expectations that are put on us whether you call them familial or societal you know they're their expectations that are coming from outside. You know? mm -hmm. And and have you been happy with that? Is that something that you struggle with, or have struggled with? You know, so I guess I can answer that. Do you want to answer that? Yeah. I, yeah. Go sure. for it. Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, <laughs> You know, for the longest time, I was really passionate about architecture. I mean, as soon as I started studying it, I didn't start until I was 30, by the way. I went back to school and got a master's in architecture after working uh, for eight years and had an incredible education at Syracuse University. And I mean, I developed a, a deep passion for it 
very quickly. And that lasted for a long, long time. But I have to say it's been beaten out of me now. Hmm. And I'm now retired. Like in the last few weeks, I feel like I'm fully retired. It's taken me about a year to do that. But I'm carrying his burden now. So, yeah. So, uh, so the answer is yes, that it would, that it was a very, uh, that it, that, that I, I was really happy with that choice, you know, but there is, there are so many frustrations associated with architecture is no different from art. It's a very poorly paid profession. That's, that's full of angst and, and, uh, difficulty and conflict and, and, it, you know, so, um, and a culture that doesn't support it. I mean, really, right, right. In the states, people don't understand what they don't understand um, symbolic meaning in anything, let alone right. Buildings. And there's no, they don't value it. They don't, they don't understand that design, good design, takes time, and uh, you know, so you're, you're constantly beating your head against the wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think that that's that's a, a common thread, no matter what your um, if you're working with clients, that's sort of something that you get to do is beat your head against the wall that you that your clients are not you. <laughs> but we can also say, and I think Graham would, would agree that there have been many times when it's been very rewarding, and that the and that a better outcome was achieved through the collaborative process with our clients than, than would have been achieved on our own. Oh so, yeah. So that's also true. So it's, oh, yeah. it's again, before we started this conversation, we were talking about the sexual harassment question and I know I'm treading on, on dangerous territory here, but there is always, you know, these demons, these, these awful human beings, who are guilty of this behavior can also embody brilliance and true uh, value in culture, and they can embody both things. You know, right. and the same is true with with the world that we navigate in between art and commerce. It's, yep. it's not one or the other, but both at the same time. You know, right. And, and uh, so requires a, it requires some competency with nuance, and I'm afraid many people, especially men, don't have that. <laughs> but we won't go down that path. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that I think is important relative to what you're doing with Awaken Authenticity, and in this culture, one has to pursue a path that is not immediately evident that it's going to bear fruit. Hmm. And you just have to you just have to dive in and take a bunch of lumps for sometimes for years before you can navigate into a position where you're really able to do the good that you want to be doing, whatever that might be. Yeah. You know. Well, and that's something that um, we've talked obliquely about a little bit, Graham, with uh, your boys, my cousins, doing jobs that aren't necessarily jobs that they have studied for, but in which they are learning different and new skills. And it will probably be at some point in the future, something where they look back and think, oh my gosh, these skills that I've been doing, uh, you know, you can, you can marry whatever background you have to the things that I don't know. It seems like there's a lot that coalesces eventually. Time is cool in that everything that happens in the past kind of falls into place at some point. Yeah. yeah this, this is happening with my older son had, has spent years working for companies that are all about really making money, um, doing work that he likes with people that he likes, but he's now working for a company it's also very much about making money, but it's but there's a, a fantastic social component to what's going on with what he's doing, and it's really exciting because he's wanted to be there, and now he is, and uh, so uh, that just started about a month ago, and, and uh, pretty pretty thrilling for him. Yeah, that's great. So if if we could talk a little bit about um, you know in in the arc of your life your successes and failures, and um, just the idea, talk a little bit, so it is evident that successes and failures are just sort of like a, 
these are words that are very dualistic and don't necessarily mean much in the scheme of life, but um, at the time they can be either incredibly inspiring or like really devastating. <laughs> and um, over the courses of your life, like what are the big experiences that you've had, whether at the time they were successes or failures that have brought you to where you are now in a way that helps you identify who you really are um, in a deep and meaningful way. So one, one of the things that um, a life in architecture um, um, allows, if you will, is, uh, is a really broad base of interest. And, and so I, I get to talk myself into believing that my continued involvement in music and woodworking all somehow helps to support my, my identity as an architect. And, uh, and I think there's some truth to that. But, so I, I have some, I've managed to keep kind of a multidisciplinary uh, life going, even as I've been working my butt off, you know, uh, during, during uh, the work week. Uh, primarily mm -hmm. as an architect um, uh, and that's been that's good you know I mean when I when I at the end of a long uh, day or week to be able to come home and, and focus on writing music or whatever it is that kind of takes my mind off of what's going on in the office is um, that also has some creative juice that's um, that's a coping mechanism and strategy and that uh works for me uh, yeah so and uh, so so i don't know if that was so much deliberate or due to forethought and planning so much as it is uh, as much as it is just accidental but it is part of my you know continued experience as a you know, as somebody who's building still building a business mm -hmm. so um it, do you want to add anything to that, Graham? Well, I mean, I, I, I would, uh, I, I, I was thinking of um, being a parent is, is, the, is the thing. I, I've been really fortunate in my family life. I sort of think that my kids are about as easy as a child could be for, the, for their parents. I mean, I, we've been really, and I have no, no, not a clue why that is. Yes. You know, because you just, it's just the, you know the opportunities and the you see people that should be in the same boat and there they're, there's more struggle and everybody's different but i credit the waterboarding <laughs> yeah that could be it <laughs> I, a little off in the way, you know? I think that was that's that what was i felt no, 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 but i failed to waterboard them and i think that was a huge oversight <laughs> 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 No, no, Dick Cheney. Anyway, you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like for you to help. Yeah. That's true for me. I mean, having having the kids as a, you know, when they were young, I mean, we've been empty nesters now for years, but having them as a kind of a, a steadying force, though they weren't doing that deliberately, they that's part of the role they play, you know. You know, one of the one of the biggest. This is <laughs> going to sound a little off, like in left field, but um, no, in left field. But um, uh, one of the big successes that I uh, think of in my, for, as I look back and having, you know, sort of, um, I've come to a place that I would say sort of completed a career. I guess this is that in the. I started work in 19 professional work in 1977 and with the exception of four years of graduate school, I've been working, you know, full time since then. In that entire time, there has only been a four year period in which I couldn't walk or bike to work. And I had been walking and biking to work my entire professional career. And not long, long, short, short distances, really, relatively. And that's been a priority for me, and I've been able to make that happen. 
And I think that may be one of the most um, significant um, successes in my life. I, I, I can't, I can't over uh, emphasize the positive effects that that has had for me. Actually, that's a perfect transition. I was just thinking about how, I mean, as poles, we are doers. We do, do, do. We create, we create. We spend so much time doing stuff, whatever it may be. And I was thinking about how, in, in my own conception of what makes a fully realized human being is just being aware of our physical body. And so you touched on that by talking about the importance of walking and biking. And I was thinking when Clyde was talking about, you know, rather than doing, like what the importance of being. And I know, uh, Clyde, you practice yoga pretty regularly, or at least you have in the past. Um, and, and if you could both talk about the, the space in your own lives where you are just being and not doing, if there's any more to add there. You go first. This is when I'm asleep. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Painting is probably for me, painting and drawing is, uh, I know you're, I'm doing at those moments, but, um, it's, those are the headspace that I'm in when I'm painting and drawing is, uh, it's so abstracted from any kind of, uh, well, it's just abstracted. It just takes me out of, out of the, the, the sense of, um, of needing to be something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so I have, a, I have things too that, that, uh, wherein I lose track of time. And I think that that is kind of a one measure of, of being in the moment, I think, is when you lose track of time, which is what I think is very prescribing. Um, and that my yoga practice and my and breathing work has been really important for me, you know, since my late twenties or twenties. Mm -hmm. um, uh, lately, as of the last year or so, year and a half ish, I've been I have a daily meditation practice. Mm -hmm. that is, in part, as a way of and I don't know, I've wanted to establish a daily habit of meditation for years, but I was unable to kind of make it happen. It was really when Graham started pulling out of the firm and I was trying to decide if I wanted to take this on. And it's that, it was that, tra that stress that imposed or that um, decision to embrace this new paradigm that, that helped that to happen. And so, but whether it's meditation or painting or, or, playing music or, you know, I think having those things, I mean, I talked about a little earlier, coming home and playing my guitar is a similar kind of thing for me where I don't, I don't, I'm often working on compositional ideas and I'm working on something in the way that Graham's working on a painting, but I do get lost in, in it. And, yeah. and that, yes, having something that does that for you, uh, preferably that isn't, you know, uh, sex uh, related or a, an addiction <laughs> you know there's a fine line to walk there between something that, that makes you feel that way that's addictive on the one like hand Facebook and, for example right yeah like <laughs> social media can be that um, I don't know. everybody has to make their own judgment about where that is for them but, but th th I think I, we all we both have had things like that in our lives you know? yeah I think, I think for me um, I've been cursed and blessed with uh, the being very uh, sensitive, I guess, to visual feedback. So mm -hmm. I'm looking out the window here, and um, uh, can you see the tree out there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. And you're both you're both like staring yeah, out there. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Well, yeah. and so for me, I mean, when when I think about moments when I'm most mindful. I mean, I think very often it's, it's prompted by something visual and like the, the autumn colors, I have experiences of being, you know, presented with a, a view like that and, and having it be a transcendent experience, just take me, takes me away, you know, and uh, 
it fills me and uh and it empties me at the same time and and uh so you know i think that's something that's just built into my who i am and uh and i think it's a real it's a real uh blessing you know yeah yeah i get the same experience dancing no matter what the day or weeks or years have brought as far as stress goes i can uh you know just getting deep into my physical body and just moving in space just give it gets me out of my head which i could i'm, I'm in my head so much of the time and to be in my body and be physically aware rather than mentally aware is a is a major gift yeah yeah well, i think it takes conscious attention to sometimes to get there yeah for sure and it takes a lot of practice to feel like it's uh something that you um can slide into with ease <laughs> yeah, for those different intelligences like physical mm -hmm. or emotional intelligence yeah yeah Awareness. yeah is there anything else related to authenticity in general or your own lives that you would like to share before we finish this The importance of authenticity in architecture, mm -hmm. and um, that may be in some ways the most significant challenge that a, a serious architect has, a design architect, not not just an architect, but someone who's who's passionately pursuing design excellence, is finding authenticity um, because you're always um, um, you're influenced by everything that has gone before. Yeah. We're also trying to understand where we are now in our culture, in our history, in our humanity. And we're also trying to anticipate where we're going and trying to provide for that. And so um, looking for an authentic visual expression of, of those things is, is a gigantic challenge. Yeah, I mean, and I think that that's a really good correlation to the rest of our experienced life. I mean, I feel like art uh in general has those same conundrums to deal with but in some ways it's a lot easier through music or visual art to to overcome those things because there's not the same sort of expectation of what a painting or a song should sound like as there is uh the expectation of what a building should provide or look like and um you know in in some ways i think that architecture is a really really close uh has a really close connection in that way to our own personal lives like we what we should be doing as people in this culture in this time is um and 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 drawing like so many of the expectations that we have for ourselves or for our family members or whatever come from what was expected forever ago and not really conceptualized in a in a in a way that is current and um relevant to now and here so that's i feel like that's a really interesting comparison mm -hmm. yeah so, I, I, you know how do you uh yeah i'm not you know you know what's missing from that for me is that um, if when you're studying art and architecture, you're if you're really a student of those subjects, you immerse yourself in the history of them, mm -hmm. and so there's this whole polemical aspect to them that that you know that you can study for your entire lifetime and not know it all. And uh, I don't know. I suppose there's something like that in philosophy and. In, in human in personal development, but I, I don't I don't know what it is. I guess just reading philosophers and a lot of self help books. <laughs> but you know, one of the paradigms that architects of yesteryear didn't have to face was the notion of global warming. That was not a reality, and this is a new reality that that sort of embodies you know what the that question of 
you know, um, moving from here forward, it has yeah. changed the paradigm mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah. attending to that it becomes paramount. Um, you know, on the question of authenticity, whether it's with architecture or music making, you know, I th for me, I think the, the core question is how you bring yourself into partnership. Because, you know, we don't design architecture in a vacuum. We're always working with others. And so yeah. if the, the end result is successful when it, when it genuinely reflects the, the collective intention, mm. right? And it's true, it's true in music making too, unless you're a solo artist. For me, that's where the interest and where the, the, where the heart of the matter lies is in relationship and how we navigate uh, through relationship and bring your full self to bear in relationship. And then what grows out of that is, is the product. Um, but, and it's true, if you think about our political environment right now, which is so divisive, um, for me, the issue is not who's right, who's wrong, who's on what side or the other. It's, the, it's that middle ground. How do, we nap, how do we bring people to the table and have a civil discourse so that we can collectively move forward? Right now, we're paralyzed. Yeah. From, uh, and that, so, so uh, the authenticity question, I think, is really uh, intimately um, uh, connected to and bound to the question of how we engage in relationship. And um, so, which I think means bringing your full self to bear. So <laughs> it's a, a multi-layered onion, isn't it? Yeah, what do you mean when you say bring yourself, full, bring yourself fully to bear? What do you mean when you say that? I mean that uh, one has to be fearless about being uh, being true to yourself in relationship, and you and you have to be um, you have to have uh, um, the ground the the rules for engagement have to be shared by others so that you can have a you can bring yourself fully to bear and be. Uh, able to have a, a civil exchange that results in a, in a positive outcome. Right, yeah, no, that reminds me of like, you know, if, if you are just in the place where this is kind of new to you to recognize that like you don't have to follow rules, like it's important to find a safe place where you can explore and figure out who you are and why and what fits and what doesn't so that once you figure that out, then you can go back out into the rest of the world and express it in a way that is open and not sheltered. And I feel like that's, that's a huge um, thing that a lot of people face, that they've never been in a safe place long enough to release those, um, those barriers and those defensive mechanisms, which have a real reason for existing, but aren't necessarily helpful in the long run. <laughs> Yeah, and where do you learn those skills? You know, I think we're really we're really fortunate in our familial culture uh, to to have the ability to talk about things. Yeah, you mean our like the pole family. The pole family. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> while you know, when I was a teenager, I thought Dad was nothing but a pain in the ass, and later I come came to appreciate his forthrightness was really um, a huge gift, and that. Mm -hmm something that I think we've all benefited from because we learned how to deal with difficult issues in a forthright way. That's yeah. not something that everybody is gifted with, you know, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's served us, I think, in our parenting and in our practice, don't you, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. That's been a, uh, I think that's an important piece. So I don't think we're going to be very helpful for people who don't, you know, haven't had that that sort of uh, basic training, um, that's, you know, how do you get that basic training if it doesn't come from, from your familial structure? Mm -hmm. That's outside my pay grade. That's what I do. <laughs> well, I create yeah. that safe space to uh, offer it. That's exactly what I am doing. What a perfect way to end this interview. <laughs> <laughs> a little plug. <laughs> Um, so thank you both so much for taking time on this Saturday morning to, uh, to speak with us.
You're welcome. You're welcome. Enjoy yeah. It. And um, before we go, last thing I wanted to ask you was if you were sitting across the table from somebody who was feeling really stuck and frustrated in their life, what advice would you give them? Try to get out of your head. Whatever that means for you, find a way to get out of your head. Something gets you into a different, your body and uh, yeah. I'd say take a, take a trip somewhere um, for an extended period, at least two weeks and make it a trip that challenges your abilities. And, yeah, maybe it perhaps puts your, your, uh, your um, troubles and concerns in some perspective, because certainly most of our troubles and concerns are, can be, be, can be uh, dwarfed by the troubles and concerns of others. Definitely. Not to belittle them, but, you know, but. And I think, yeah, and I think that even, you know, I think that people may think they can't take a trip, but they can. And that's part of the, that's part of the challenge that they have to overcome is finding how to make it happen, right? And yeah, definitely. You know, something that challenges your difficulties could be that simple. If you, like, make an exception to what you think are the rules and you do something that's. Yeah, that's it's exactly outside, outside your comfort zone. It's I think getting outside your comfort zone is that's why travel is so important because you very frequently find yourself outside your comfort zone, and it's incredible what that does for your perspective. Totally, totally. That I mean, that's exactly something that I found over and over um, when I paddled the Mississippi. I mean, I I was unemployed and had been for six months and um people that i met along the way would say oh i would love to do that and i said why aren't you doing that and then they would say oh because i can't afford it i'm like uh i'm i'm i have zero money and have had no income for six months and um i made this happen like if that's really if that i mean probably that's just an excuse but if that's really your only excuse that's not worthwhile because here I am doing it. <laughs> you find a way. If it's, it's a, if it's important enough to you, you find a way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it kind of goes back to your, you, you know, I, I, I got a little, uh, some bristles up when you said uh, um, that um, rules aren't helpful in the long run. Those rules that we're trying to, and uh, so, you know, I, I don't agree. When I was talking about uh, self-defense mechanisms. Yeah, you were, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you, that was, and I, I, I don't agree with that. I think that the rules are um, really important and uh, that they're there um, probably to help us understand how to navigate in our culture more than anything else. Um, but then this question about whether you can afford to, to paddle the Mississippi, for example, um, is becomes a question about um, can you find the the um, strength to break rules that you think are paramount? You know, like not having income for for a while. Yeah. Your wits, you know. Say in in your paddling, you were having to abide by a lot of rules. Or you wouldn't have made it to the end of that adventure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that's a really good point. The idea that, um, like, I, like I said, the, the, the defense mechanisms that we have or the barriers that we have or the rules that we have are there for good reasons. Um, but they don't necessarily serve us all the time to have them up all the time. And it's a matter of like, learning the rules so that you can break them when it's appropriate, right? Exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. We start our process in architecture by identifying constraints. That's really where we start. And then we see how we can... That's a good practice. Work through them. Yeah. Thank you again. Have a great day. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, Love you. Alyssa. Love you too. Bye. Bye.